actually a, a pretty new one. So we got uh, established in 2019. So we try to be quite active in the sense that we try to, you know, organize events. But of course, with the COVID situation, that's pretty challenging. That's why we are mainly restricted to these online events, but nevertheless, still interesting, still relevant, I would say. Um, I take advantage actually of, of this uh, webinar also to invite you to the Eurotox meeting that will take place this year in Maastricht in the Netherlands in September, where there also will be a meeting, uh, a rather concise meeting, but nevertheless a meeting of the uh, Intutox for the in vitro in silico toxicology speciality section, which is part of the Eurotox slash EUTOX uh, meeting this year. So last year we started to organize this series of webinars uh, and we wanted to pursue this uh, this uh, year. So um, with this, it's a big honor for me to introduce the first speaker or at least the speaker of the first webinar uh, and that is uh, Mark Tönis. So Mark, um, he basically um, has a PhD in biology and he has a wide range of interests. And he's working basically at the uh, Hogeschool uh, Utrecht um, University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. He has a background in embryonic development and neurobiology and immuno immunology. And he has main interest in the fields of toxicology, also immunology, of course, alternatives to laboratory animals. So hence the inclusion in the Intutox series of webinars and of specific relevance of today machine learning. And that also explains the topic of uh, the, let's say, the webinar of today, which will be about applied artificial intelligence in toxicology with a focus on deep learning. So you might know that toxicology, uh, including in vitro toxicology, has become a very, very interdisciplinary kind of science. And especially, we have seen a lot of the computational approaches being introduced, among which is artificial intelligence. So before I give the screen to Mark, uh, just a couple of housekeeping, uh, let's say, uh, well, information. If you so please mute yourself. Uh, don't speak up during the um, during the actual webinar. If you would have questions, uh, please be free or feel free to share them in the chat. I will be following up on this. We will be having a uh, Q and A session at the end of the webinar. Unless you have a very burning question throughout the webinar, just uh, drop me a, a chat. So, well, drop me a message in the chat, I would say, and then uh, I will uh, I will interfere with that as necessary. And without further ado, I would like to share the screen, or at least I would like to ask uh, uh, Mark to share the screen. And uh, well, the screen is yours. Go ahead, Mark. Yes, uh, thank you, Mathieu. It's actually an honor to be. Uh to be presenting this work today. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the topic of today is applied intellig uh, artificial intelligence in toxicology. And I really like the developments of the uh, specific um, subclass of artificial intelligence called deep learning, which I think is a, is a huge promise and has uh, seen a lot of developments in terms of techni uh, technological advance over the past five years. It's sort of a rebirth of the neural networks that were um, uh, a very uh, in favor during the 90s. And due to the uh, emergence of cheaper hardware and also improvements in the hardware technology, uh, they have uh, seen a revival in, in, in the scientific field over the, let's say, past five to 10 years. And I'm really, really enthusiastic to talk about uh, this topic. Uh, as Mathieu as mentioned, I work at the University of Applied Sciences in Utrecht, where I uh, lead a small data science group uh, where we focus on mainly the development of software for uh, data collection. And also uh, we develop uh, models for new, uh, natural language processing in which we use uh, deep learning. And on the screen, you, you see uh, an example of a, a deep learning network, a neural network uh, used for natural language processing to harvest uh, causal relationships from, from uh, literature, uh, causal relationships between uh, a compound and what this compound is, uh, is, is, is causing uh, in uh, described in the literature. So um, 
Uh, today's talk will be uh, quite hands-on. I will try to, to keep it as practical as possible. Uh, but we, we need to dive a little bit into the mathematics of deep learning. I promise I will not uh, go into very much detail. Uh, a talk like this, 40 minutes or 45 minutes, we'll see how we're, how we're going to do this. Uh, it doesn't allow for very in-depth uh, mathematical uh, exploration, but um, we, will, we will look at some, uh, some formulas and some mathematical concepts uh, uh, in due time. I'll give a very short introduction to machine learning with a focus on deep learning. Then we're going to see hands-on, um, in this case in R, how to build a deep learning model. And I will use a very famous example um, from the MNIST uh, handwritten data set that is sort of the hello world of, of deep learning, which we'll see in a bit. Uh, we will look at how input data looks like and how you need to transform uh, most of the time your, your data uh, to make it suitable to feed into a neural network. You cannot you, uh, most of the time uh, feed uh, uh, raw data into a neural network. So it needs to adhere to some, some specifics and we'll, we'll, look, we'll take a look at those. Uh, as I said, I, I will show you some of the concepts really in a hands-on code demonstration uh, later on in the talk. Then we'll, uh, we'll look at some examples uh, in toxicology. I, I decided to keep that really short because uh, there's a really, really a lot to say about um, applications in toxicology, but just wanted to dive in into one or two uh, quick examples, but really focus on the, on the hands-on, uh, how to get started with, with these type of models in your own work. And then if we have time in the end, I have a spare topic uh, where we can spend a little bit time uh, talking about how to start and uh, how to address the reproducibility problem uh, that is that is uh, associated with uh, everything that has to do with coding and data. But before I do that, I would like to go uh, and and get to know you a little bit more. Uh, I've pre prepared a, a mentee uh, poll, and I would like to invite you to go to uh, this mentee on your browser or your phone, you can just go to www.menti.com and enter uh, the specific uh, code that will uh, put you into this mentee. And I will just ask you two questions in order to get to know the audience a little bit better so that I have an idea who is uh, virtually in front of me. So please uh, go into the to the Mentimeter and I will uh, like to start with the first question. So the first question is, I, associated I associate artificial intelligence with. So please enter a keyword. Uh, it's best if you enter a single keyword uh, and you're allowed to enter as much as, as three uh, submissions. So the first, word is in there it's robot not surprising complicated matter that's a fun one I hope by the end of uh, of this talk, I've I've lowered the bar a bit on that, or I might have convinced you that it is complicated sometimes. So I'll let this run for a bit, not to lose too much time. So at the heart of this, not surprising, is computer. And I think uh, there's no artificial intelligence without uh, some form of, of computational uh, hardware and uh, obviously also software. And as I mentioned in the introduction slide, the way we are using machine learning at the moment in, in many, many different 
uh, problems and solving tasks, not only in science, but also in business and also in driving uh, and a lot of other things uh, has uh, is, is mainly attributed to the fact that computers in terms of computational power have become more cheap uh, and also more advanced uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, this is also, there's been a doubling each, uh, each two years in the, in the amount of, uh, of storage and computational power in the computer, it's called Moore's law. And the prediction is that within a few years, most law will come to an end. There will be a limit to what we can put in the, in the hardware of a computer. And there is room to improve on the software on the, and on the platforms of which I will speak a bit uh, at the end of the talk. So I'll move on to the next question. This describes me best. I'm an experienced machine learning modeler. I'm an intermediate machine learning modeler. I'm just starting with machine learning. What is machine learning? Please. Pick one. So, okay, the idea is fairly easy to grasp from this slide. I think at least for the respondents, most of the audience is quite unfamiliar with the uh, topic of machine learning. And I think that, that this is the right talk for you uh, in the sense that I will, would really very much like to lower the bar uh, and hope I can give you a few hints on, on where to go next uh, after this, this presentation, if you would like to learn more, or even if you would like to start uh, yourself uh, within your own work, applying uh, some of the, of the concepts that, will, uh, that, that I will show. So thank you for, for, for this. It's, uh, it was quite enjoyable to see uh, who I have in front of me uh, during this talk. So now uh, on to the topic. If we consider artificial intelligence is actually consisting of an ecosystem of uh, types of machine learning uh, uh, implementations. Machine learning uh, is everything that involves a machine, a computer, an algorithm to solve a specific task or goal. So considering all artificial intelligence together, any system that can pick up signals from its environment and uh, take action to, to yield a specific goal is considered an intelligent agent. And the artificial part is that it's not a living being, but artificial in the, ten, in the sense that it is a machine or, or an algorithm or a computer. Artificial intelligence divided into uh, machine learning and deep learning, which is a specific form of modeling that uses neural networks, is part of that, uh, of, of, of that machine learning category. And then aside from that, but lending uh, algorithms and models from machine learning and deep learning is natural language processing, where we use uh, the machine to understand natural language uh, and, and, and to to extract information or to translate or to understand meaning uh, of natural language. And then apart from that, I decided to also uh, put a graph algorithms in there because uh, over the last years or so, uh, implementations of deep learning within the graph algorithms uh, have gained interest in science and they are spe specifically relevant for uh, things like QSAR, uh, which is, which I'm going to talk a, a little bit more 
on uh, at the end of the talk. So classically, we've used the computer to solve problems um, by encoding rules that apply on the data and that provide answers. So that's the classical programming paradigm where on the basis of the answer that I would like to get, I would program specific rules that would lead to that answer, having the data as input. But machine learning um, puts the things on its head uh, where the machine is, is presented with data and also answers in terms of, for example, labels, or in terms of, for example, a specific task, and it needs to figure out uh, the rules. So what do we need if, if we want to do machine learning? Obviously we need data. So if we consider pictures, for example, uh, I depict here two uh, color images that are presented to a machine learning algorithm. And the task here is to classify the picture that has the most green in it. Or another task could be to optimize the amount of saturation for the input uh, picture. So in order to solve such a task, we need to consider the data and how the data could be represented in the machine to enable the machine to learn uh, to do this task. So if we consider a colored picture, we can uh, dissect that picture into different channels, different color channels. And these color channels all, all have a value. The picture has dimensions. Uh, and this is another way of representing a picture. And if we can break down these uh, features, these attributes of such a picture in the machine, the machine can learn to associate these attributes to the original uh, uh, picture and thereby solving uh, this task. So in, if the task is to classify the picture that contains the most green, then it needs to figure out which attribute is linked to the amount of green, which in this case is one of the RGB channels. So if we consider another example where we just have a Y uh, and an X axis and a few white and a few black dots, we can ask the machine to solve uh, the problem to predict or to come up with an algorithm that separates the black dots from the white dots. So based on the coordinates on the axis, what color is our point? And we can solve this problem by representing the data on, in a, uh, uh, differently. But what we do need, if we do machine learning, is a way to measure whether the algorithm is doing a, jo a good job. So most of the time you, you need a measure. And in deep learning, this measure is called the loss. And we'll talk a bit on that uh, in a second to see if the, if the, if the algorithm is solving the problem uh, efficiently. Another measure to measure uh, whether an algorithm or machine learning algorithm is doing a good job is the accuracy. Does the label that was associated with the input correspond to the prediction that the machine learning is provided? So if we look at this black white dot example, we can see that if we rotate the Y and the X axis and represent the data in a different way without changing the actual underlying data, we can see that we can, can, can come up with a fairly easy way of classifying these dots. If X is lower than zero, then the dot is white. And if X is higher than zero, uh, the dot is black. This is a very elementary uh, way of looking at data representations. We don't actually change the data, we're just transforming and representing the data in a different way or even in a different space. 
So then how do we actually build a deep learning model or a neural network? Very nicely illustrated uh, by, by really uh, very good animations is the three blue, one brown uh, dot com uh, site. And I would really recommend having a look there if you want to learn more about the specifics and the underlying theory uh, of deep learning and neural networks. So if we just go over the steps that you need to take in order to come up with a neural network or a machine learning algorithm, uh, you need to think hard about the problem that you would like to solve. There are different types of problems uh, and they need different types of models. You can either go for a problem where you have uh, labeled data uh, or the data could be unlabeled and you would like to learn a bit more about clustering. Then obviously you need some data and this is uh, not uh, in, in, in real life, not so easy. You need experiments. You need to go and fetch data from the database or several databases, enrich it, explore it, uh, fix data quality problems. Then uh, pre-process the data uh, to enable the network to accept that data in a presentable form. Not all data can go directly into a neural network. So you need to transform it in a, in a way that is acceptable for the network to learn from. Then the construction of the, of the deep learning model itself, you need to consider all, all sorts of things like how is the network formed? How many layers do I need? How many neurons? Some parameters that you need to uh, tweak and I will talk a, a bit on them in the, in the slides to come. Then obviously uh, you need to expose the data to training, uh, the, the expose the model to training data. And after the training is done, uh, we need to validate the model to see if our decisions that we made to construct the model were correct or not. And most of the time they're not. So then we need to improve or get more data or look at the problem uh, from a different angle, re-articulate the problem and maybe come up with it with a different model altogether. So this is a circular motion and uh, it looks quite familiar probably uh, because it has elements of the empiric cycle, which is and probably known to all of you. So in practice, this could, could be the workflow that you could use to, to build a deep learning uh, uh, a model or a neural network. Considering the input is very heterogeneous, there's data from databases, structured and unstructured data, um, data from experiments, enrichment. Those are the steps that you need to, to tackle the input side. And then the articulation of the problem involves asking the question, what do I would like to predict? Is my problem considering clustering classification? Is it a binary classification? Or do I have two classes or do I have multiple classes? Um, is the problem related to pattern recognition, for example, imaging or video? Or is it more time series related? And do I have, uh, have an axis of, of, of time in there? And then obviously you need to monitor uh, the performance of the algorithm. So here we can see the famous uh, MNIST neural network resembled as a four layer neural network. And on the left side, you see the input layer. The digits here are grayscale images of 28 times 28 pixels. So the grayscale values are normalized and they are presented to what we call the input layer. 
So this, the input layer is the first layer of the neural network. So these layers, A0, A1, A2, and A3, represent the different layers. The outer layer, so the first layer is called the input layer, and the last layer on the right hand is called the output layer. When we present this network with data, the input layer responds to the input pixels. And there are 784 inputs, units, or also called neurons, responding to these pixels. The uh, input units that are presented with a high level of pixels have a high level of activation. And they, uh, they relay that information to the next layers, which are called the hidden layers. So here we have an input, two hidden layers, and an output layer. Let's look at the output layer for a second. We see that the output layer responses to the input digit. In this case, the, the, the neural network is presented with two different inputs, two nines, if you will. And in this case, the network has been trained to correctly recognize the input nine as a nine. The output layer responds classifying the input as a nine. So the activation of this last layer is actually an output of probabilities. Each output neuron will output a number between zero and one, um, telling whether, this, he, uh, whether the network thinks that the input is associated with uh, the digit that it corresponds to. And in this case, nine gives a high probability, so a high, has a high activation. Now, the way this works is that all these connections are weights. And when a neuron is, has a high connection, a high activation, it relays that information to the second layer with a high weight. But we need something else in order to prevent the network from learning things that are not real or not associated with the input data. And these are called biases. And these biases can be considered as sort of a threshold for the activation. When the activation times the weight is below the bias, then we have no activation of the unit. And on the next slide, you will see how this is, uh, how this works in mathematical sense. So first look at the input layer. X1 to X4 are inputs. The lines between the input layer and the first hidden layer are the weights. And the activation of the second layer is dependent on the input. So the activation of the input layer times the weight plus the bias. And the bias again is the threshold that is set for, uh, for that specific uh, layer. So if that multiplication is below the threshold, we don't have an activation of that unit. And the way this works is by matrix multipl multiplication. So the weights are multiplied by the inputs in a row by column way. And then all the biases are added and that would lead to, that leads us to a new activation. And this matrix multiplication is the way information is relayed from one layer to another layer in the, deep, in, in the neural network. So here it's written in full, but if we want to write it more compactly in mathematical sense, we can say that the activation of the first hidden layer 
is dependent on the matrix of the weight times the activations of the input layer plus the biases. And then RELO stands for an activation function, which we need to get the whole thing going. So I hope this makes it a bit more clear how the mathematical engine of a neural network uh, is functioning. It's basically, you can basically consider the neural network as a big function that takes activations, weights and biases and outputs a probability. So this is how it works in practice. We have some data and we split that data up into a training data, training data set and a test data set. Then we expose the input layer to the train data. We have multiple hidden layers and we have an output layer that outputs a probability or some other prediction for the associated task at hand. And then we have to choose things like the activation function, the number of units or neurons in a layer, um, and the output activation function. We have to decide on what we like to monitor. And in this case, we would like to monitor the accuracy of, of the prediction. And we have to decide on things like the loss function and the optimizer, which are associated with seeing uh, whether the, the network is learning or not. And we'll take a look at how this works in practice in a second. So some terminology, a category in machine learning um, is called a class. So if we have a category in the data, we would like to predict its, its class and the prediction is generated by the neural network. Data points are called samples and the class associated with a specific uh, sample is called a label. So on the data side, we have labels and on the prediction side, we have classes. Uh, sorry, on the data side, we have categories and on the prediction side, we have classes and labels. So how does this input data of a neural network uh, look like. Central to neural networks are tensors. And tensors are basically vectors or a representation of a vector. And they can uh, function as input for all different types of machine learning algorithms. And this is because we cannot feed most raw data into neural networks, we need to transfer the data, transform the data to tensors. So let's see how this works in practice. Here we have a one dimensional tensor. It's just a collection of numbers. It is what we also call in programming a vector. Then a two dimensional vector or two dimensional tensor is basically a matrix a collection of rows and columns that represent a numeric space. Usually it's samples on the uh, rows and features on the columns. Three-dimensional tensors are usually things like uh, time samples, time series, where we have a collection of data that progresses over time. We have a third dimension that can be re represented by the time axis. And then four dimensional tensors could be images where we have samples, the height and the width of, this, of, the, of the image, channels that represent the colors, or if we code it differently, depending on the platform that we use, 
to train the model, we can have samples first, then channels, and then hide them with. So this is a convention that is different between different uh, platforms of deep learning. And then the most complicated example of real life tensors are five dimensional tensors, where we have basically animated pictures, videos, where we have an additional uh, axis called frames, which again represents time. So considering the time, I would like to go to the our studio just to show you how a deep learning uh, model looks like in practice. I, I'm going to skip some, some of the code that I have, have prepared, but you can review it because it's all shared on GitHub. Oh, sorry. So here you can see my RStudio environment. And I've prepared a bit of code to show you how training of, an, of a neural network works. First, let's see the data. So I'll load some packages and I will just show you one or two of the digits of the MNIST data set, how they are represented if you explore them. These is, this is the raw data of the MNIST data set. Here we have a five and here we have a four. So exploring the data before you start modeling is, a, is an important step. And I, should, I would really recommend to do this in code as much as possible. Because writing code is a lot more reprodu reproducible than pressing buttons uh, and using a graphical user interface because code can be reviewed by you, uh, by future you and others that you collaborate with. So the first thing we need to do is to transform this raw data into a tensor. And because there are 60,000 digits in the training set that all have a dimension of 28 by 28 pixels, we can reshape that data into an array, which is basically a tensor. And then the values of these pixels, these grayscale pixels, pixel, uh, pixels are zero to 255. And in order to normalize that data as input for the neural network, we divide the uh, tensor by 255 to get a value between zero and one. And we do the same for the test data. So if we run that code, we download the data, we reshape, and transform to a tensor. We normalize the data. We get the labels. So each digit is provided with a label so that we can see how the model is doing. And then we define the network. And here we can see again the four layers and I will hide these. So I have here actually a model of three layers, an input layer, an output layer, and uh, a hidden layer. 265 units of the input layer, 125, 28 units of the output layer, uh, of the hidden layer, and then 10 for each digit in the output layer. And the shape again is 784, um, and that's the shape of the tensor because the pictures, remember, are 28 by 28. So, and then we have decide to decide on a few parameters. We want to see accuracy and then we can fit the model.
And then the model starts, starts learning, starts running. And in order to see if the model is performing, we need to consider the loss of the model. And the loss is actually the difference or the distance between the label and the prediction. So if we have a small value of the loss, we say that the model is learning things. The distance between the label and the prediction is getting smaller. So we want to optimize for the lowest loss possible. That's when the model is performing uh, the best. And here you see the blue line is the loss for the training set. But what we also see is that the loss for the validation set, so the actual check whether the model is performing well, is not so great. It is higher than the loss for the training set. And that means that the model is not performing as well on the test data as it is on the training data. And there are all sorts of steps that you could take to fix that. Probably the model is overfitting here. It's learning things, patterns in the data that are not actually specific for the input data. It goes beyond the scope of this talk to show what you can do, uh, but this is why there are two additional layers in this model called the dropout. They regularize the model, they prevent the model from overfitting. So if we run the model again, with the dropout layers activated, we can see what happens. I'm not going to, to discuss in detail what the dropout is. You can also review it in training and on the test set are quite equal after five iterations. And this is, this is how you would normally would like to see the performance of this model. I will stop this demo and go back to the, to the slides. So I'll skip this section for a bit and move on to the examples in toxicology. And I want to pick a specific example that I think um, is really benefiting or could be benefiting from neural networks and application of deep learning. And that is the structure activity relationships. I will mention uh, something about QSRs and I will briefly discuss uh, the RAZR approach that was published uh, by the group of Thomas Hartung and uh, Tom Luchtefeld. Classically, QSRs are models that relate physical chemical characteristics to biological activity of a compound. And the challenge that we have here is to represent a molecule in a way that really captures all the attributes of a molecule. We know that similar compounds can have very different effects. And we know that very different compounds can have the same biological effect. So QSRs live under the premise that similar compounds have similar effects, but we know in practice that this is not always the case. So it could be that we're, not, we're just not capturing enough attributes to really make this connection. And this is something that with the help of deep learning has been addressed uh, in the field of QSRs. And that's basically uh, looking for different ways of representing a molecule. And there's a, there are multiple ways to do this. One example, which is also limited, 
uh, but could help uh, has been published uh, in this paper here, uh, where they try to represent a mole molecular uh, formula, molecular structure by a so-called directed acyclic graph. This can only be done with compounds that are that have non-cyclic uh, components, although there are fixes, but in principle, a directed, directed acyclic graph can't have cyclic components, hence the name. So using this uh, approach uh, could benefit over, let's say, handcrafted features as, it, as, as, as is employed in the classical QSRs, but it still has the limit that we need to re represent the molecular structure in a different way of its yeah. original structure. The way this is currently envisioned to be solved or solvable is by using graph neural networks. So if we consider that a molecular structure is a graph, we can describe that graph by, we can describe the molecule by the fact that it has atoms or so-called nodes, that it has edges or so-called connections and that each, each node and also edge has attributes. And we can teach a neural network to recognize these graph structures as they are. So the graph is really the input for this deep learning uh, model. And in that way, we can re-represent the molecular uh, structure in a better way than we can do with classical approaches. If we add on to that the possibility to not only do QSR, but to look at similar compounds in a network, we have a RASAR. So RASAR is nothing more than a QSR which takes into account the hazards of similar compounds. And what you can see here is that there are a few different compounds with effects. And the green scale represents the uh, similarity between the effects. So looking at similar compounds based on their molecular structure, and then looking at similar hazards based on the similarity in the network leads to a read across approach. We can improve this approach by using the graph convolutional networks. So the graph convolution that I showed you in the previous slide. So moving on to the final slides and then we'll go to the Q&A. If you would like to start yourself, uh, I would highly recommend start learning a programming language. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you start, whether you start with R or Python or anything else. Python is at the moment, the most versatile for deep learning, but starting basically anywhere will help you moving on to a different language. And there's, there's a lot to say about the platforms. I will not do that at this moment. So just to finish up, if you really want to start hands-on with uh, neural networks in relation to chem informatics and toxicology, I would really recommend you take a look at the Deep Chem library. It has a lot of examples and many great tutorials where you can start yourself. And finally, if you decide to go along this path, remember that reproducibility counts. If you record your code, put it under version control, you can start not only writing articles, but really have a valuable output in terms of open uh, science products like packages or documentations or tutorials that all add up to your portfolio or CV. 
So doing reproducible research is not only good bookkeep, but good bookkeeping, but it also improves the science. And with that, I would like to close this webinar. I thank you for, for your attention. And you can find the code examples and more elaborate information in the links provided. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Uh, I think uh, at least I did learn a lot. This really was starting from the basics, and I think this is exactly what was needed. So uh, that was absolutely great. Um, if I can start off, I actually have a question that more or less builds further on what you mentioned at the very end. So, I mean, artificial intelligence is really emerging in, in all fields, also including, of course, in the field of toxicology. So a lot of groups are introducing artificial intelligence tools in toxicology for a multiplicity of, of uh, applications. But how can we be sure that these methods are sound? I mean, you know, in the in vitro field, in the three R alternative field, uh, by extension, we have, of course, what is called the validation process. Uh, does something similar exist for artificial intelligence methods so that you can rely on the methods? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Mathieu. Thank you. Um, I, I think if you, I think there's a couple of things that you can consider. Uh, if you if you talk really about the algorithms and the software, I think the open source uh, software communities, in itself, have proven how they can establish uh, good quality uh, tools. So this, the, so the community itself. Uh, uh, regulates and provides openness of the tools that you can you can use. Um, in in terms of benchmarking uh, uh, AI tools, I think there, there's been a lot of progress on that as well. Um, you can, for example, imagine having uh, benchmarking data sets that you can use to to, to look at the performance of, of the model that you've just created, which with bench, benchmarking uh, metrics, so that you compare uh, how your model is actually doing on, on these type of data sets. And a good way to start uh, there would be, for example, with, with a platform called Kaggle. It's a machine learning uh, contest uh, platform where uh, where you can find uh, sets data sets that you could use to benchmark your tools i think we are not not there yet in terms of of guaranteeing quality and also openness uh, i see a lot of papers that uh, talk about building a new model without providing the necessary tools uh, to re reproduce that work and that would be uh, i think where we could uh, benefit the most really to apply open science principles uh, uh, related to this work. No, I agree, especially in view of getting this accepted by the regulators uh, uh, in the end, because this is what we want to do anyhow, uh, at least in the field of risk assessment, then I think it is really, really important to build confidence indeed. So at the start of the presentation, we received one question in the chat. I will read it out loud, but I'm not pretty sure whether it's still uh, valid because I think I could be wrong, but I think that at least part of it has been answered in the second part of your presentation, but I will read it out uh, loud uh, anyhow. So okay. how can deep learning artificial intelligence uh, help to predict drug induced liver injury? So the example uh, that was given here is if you want to know, for instance, uh, if a chemical motive uh, can lead to a reactive metabolite. So can artificial intelligence help us? and to what extent is this different from the other predictive software that is already on the market? Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I've, I've showed, uh, although very little, uh, something on this related to the QSR approaches. Um, I think if you consider the classical QSR uh, approaches where you have a limited space to represent molecules. Uh, I think really the graph 
uh, embedding of molecular structures that is now coming into uh, in, into play due to the development of graph algorithms uh, and graph deep learning uh, models uh, will really improve uh, the way we 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 in general uh, look at predicting a hazard not only for Delhi but but in general in toxicology. Uh, so this development, and that's not something I didn't mention, but has been driven uh, by uh, the prediction of the three-dimensional structures of proteins, which, uh, which has made a major leap uh, last year uh, uh, by the work of, uh, of AlphaFold 2, which also used graph embeddings to solve this 50-year-old problem of predicting a, a three-dimensional protein from its linear structure. And I think in toxicology uh, applications in AI, we will benefit uh, uh, greatly from that development. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's actually one o'clock at least here. So uh, unless there are any other questions, I think we need to more or less wrap up. I would suggest if some of, uh, of you would have additional questions you can contact mark directly if that is okay for you mark yeah definitely yeah yeah so this presentation will be uploaded to the eurotox website so you can uh, have a look at it again and as shown also on this slide i would like to already advertise the next uh, intutox webinar that will take place uh, the 22nd of february it will be a presentation or a webinar at least by Penny Mark, so from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and she will be talking about AOPs, the drug outcome pathways, which, as you probably know, are very important tools that have been introduced in the fields of toxicology and risk assessment over the past uh, few years. So with this, I would like to thank you very much, Mark, for this very, very nice and interesting presentation. And uh, of course, I would like to thank all of the attendees. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, Eurotox and Elaine in particular for helping to set up the webinar. So with this, I 